Welcome to Unit 4 of Self-Determination in the Post-Colonial World. Um, before I give an outline of this unit, I just remind you that all of the notes, the slides that I'm showing, are available freely online, so you can download them at your leisure. No need to take notes as you listen to this presentation. So on the first slide, here's an overview, as I usually give. First of all, I'll introduce the idea of the neoliberal world. Then um, talk about the history of Anglo-American liberalism as a historical project. Then some of the basic ideas of economic liberalism, which have been incorporated into the project in the, from the 19th century. Then uh, an update to today's hegemonic neoliberalism. And finally, a bit of an overview of neo-Marxist theories of imperialism, just by way of a critique or a reinterpretation of that project of hegemonic neoliberalism. And the question I've placed on the first slide is something that may be a set question for those of you that are going to do this um, course as a assessed unit at a university. Explain the main difference between neo-Marxist theories of imperialism and the neo-realist hegemonic stability theory, the two dominant views of um, the role of a big hegemon or an imperial power in today's world. By way of another overview, the neoliberal world I'll talk about is really something that has been described from the 1970s onwards, a selective revival of economic liberal ideas in support of corporate privilege, uh, in particular multinational corporations, and an aggressive expansionism linked to American hegemonic stability ideas. Liberal idealism as a historical project over several centuries has been a syncretic Western populist tradition borrowing from elements of other traditions like ideas of tolerance, pluralism, social justice, universal rights. These are not particular liberal inventions. They are things that have been grafted onto that project um, and with several variants in liberal idealism. But what we notice about all of them is that they support elite liberties and property rights. And I'll try and emphasize this by the, the short historical walk through Anglo-American liberalism from the 17th century to today. And the strong links, which have been pointed out by a number of writers, including the Italian Domenico Lucerdo, the links between the development of liberal idealism and the expansion of slavery, of colonialism and corporate rule. The reverse to what you might think of a contemporary modern liberalism. Then from the 1870s onwards, in the latter part of the 19th century, we've got this phenomenon of economic liberalism, which dispensed with the old classical ideas of um, class distribution um, that were spoken of, not just by radicals like Karl Marx, but also uh, capitalists like David Ricardo and uh, more free thinkers like Adam Smith. But really economic liberalism served to mask the rise of corporate monopolies and imperial expansion in the in the late 19th century onwards with these ideas of free markets consumer sovereignty and so on and there's some important critiques there that i've noted hegemonic neoliberalism then in some and this is an overview of the the entire presentation is a rather aggressive phase during historically during the decline of the u.s economy since at least the mid 1980s which has in many respects reduced the liberal content and increased the mercantile content of the project. Um, that is to say the direct interventions, the direct um, uh, opposition to other important powers in the world where the liberal idea had been that all could gain through trade, for example. Um, the, there was a win-win, the win-win ethos that sits behind a lot of liberal ideas these elements have begun to disappear somewhat, particularly in the world we face with uh, a huge number of economic siege measures and barriers to uh, what was originally called a free trade project. How, how are we to understand that? Finally, I'm gonna talk about the, the neo-Marxist theories of imperialism and to what extent they explain the current situation. Really, they are economic theories of imperialism. Okay, so on to the neoliberal world from the 1970s onwards, we have a revival of selective economic liberal ideas in Western countries after a period of what's been called neo-Keynesian uh, economics or fiscal management, that is to say, where the state managed the ups and downs of the economy and tried to reflate 
uh, demand or employment in, in times of recession. But in the stagflation of the 1970s, where we have combined unemployment and inflation, an unusual situation, um, there was this, uh, amongst the elites, amongst Western elites, uh, abandoning those old neo-Keynesian ideas and a revival of older economic liberal ideas to try and resuscitate accumulation in that, at that time. So the previous democratic, social democratic idea of reform where reform meant greater social justice, greater inclusion of excluded people, of workers and unemployed people, uh, addressing poverty and so on. That idea of reform was grafted into the liberal project to mean greater corporate privilege, something that would make the economy, uh, in, in inverted commas, as a whole perform better and therefore supposedly everyone would benefit in that win-win idea of liberalism. Well, in practice, it led to a period of expansion um, of the power of private banking, private finance, for example, and then uh, immediately a debt crisis in the early 1980s when the, the social regulation on banks was removed. That led to a sharp rise in interest rates and a consequent debt crisis amongst many of the former colonies which had large sovereign borrowings. That then gave leverage to some of the key institutions of the um, the post-World War II neoliberal order, the World Bank and the IMF to enforce the so-called Washington consensus policies on vulnerable nations. And that included removing the regulation on foreign direct investment, which is through multinational companies, um, demanding the privatization of social assets, demanding user pays regimes to take pressure off government budgets and so on. That package of policies called Washington consensus because everyone in Washington agreed with it. And finally, um, ideological hegemony. This type of selective liberalism of the, the recent, in recent decades has been made a natural or invisible ideology. That is to say, they are simply matters of logic or good sense that are not really put up as ideology, as ideology is said to be something foreign. Uh, and, but to some extent that's been successful, adopted by middle classes and um, uh, comprador regimes in other countries, that is to say, um, states and other regimes which serve the interests of the big uh, powers, a type of globalism which has promoted those ideas of individualism, commodification and so on, the commercialization of all social services. So let's just briefly look at a, a short video from Three Minute Theory, which outlines um, the key features of current neoliberalism. Neoliberalism. Simply, neoliberalism is the idea that society should be shaped by the free market and that the economy should be deregulated and privatized. Or even simpler, what works in the private sector will also work in the public sector. But it doesn't stop there. Neoliberalism also involves the idea that the public sector should not only follow the private sector's rules, but it should also subsidize the private sector, which we know is now owned by fewer and fewer global capitalists. Neoliberalism uses the language and tenets of classical liberalism in ways that now benefit large corporate interests. Now, the enforcement of this neoliberalism in other countries in the recent period has come through the programs I mentioned formulated by the IMF and the World Bank under the influence of so-called Washington Consensus. And through the 80s and 90s, they were called structural adjustment programs. And they've been criticized widely and most of the terms that we use have disappeared because they fell into disrepute effectively. They were seen as forms of neocolonialism. And here's one good analysis from Professor Fantuchero who said, the main problem arising from these policies um, pressured on countries which had become debtor nations under, after the debt crisis of the early 1980s um, was that the policies of structural adjustment had been weakening the role of the state. Uh, and and uh, Professor Sherry says the most crucial impact of globalization had been on the role of the state in national development. The state no longer primarily acts as a buffer against the world economy. So what he was saying was that Washington consensus policies had used this debt to weaken the capacity of the state to control the behavior of multinational corporations. They've been given a privileged role um, across the economy. And of course, in most cases, with the consent under pressure of those 
vulnerable or weak states. So there were some exceptions where some states refused to uh, agree to the sorts of conditions that were imposed on them. But in most cases, the states were relatively vulnerable and weak. Now, Professor Sherry said that equitable economic growth required a strong cooperation between both the state and civil society. That is to say, there needed to be uh, a, a strong cooperation, but also a significant amount of political will in the state to stand up to those policies and to bring about policies which would be to the benefit of the people of that state. And that pressure could only be resisted by a state with significant capacity and commitment to key human development goals. So uh, in a way you have to go back and search all of the arguments about structural adjustment and uh, privatization and so on that um, terms that were abandoned in the meeting of the IMF in 1999, the end of 1999, and some new names for those sorts of programs like poverty reduction strategies and public-private partnerships and so on, took over from those uh, uh, terms that had become dirty words in effect. Okay, let's go back to the history and take a brief run through Anglo-American liberalism, which is a long standing project, really almost four centuries long now. And uh, I start off by saying it's a syncretic or cuckoo philosophy, that is to say, its central values have always been individual property rights for an elite. And the other values such as universal rights and democracy, justice, tolerance and pluralism, which are often associated with liberalism, been borrowed and grafted in from other traditions. And when it comes to the crunch, they don't really hold up against the commitment to individual property rights and the, the elite system that really they were created to serve. Um, it was an essentially a selective project that is the selective in terms of the freedoms that were uh, indicated. Domenico Lacerdo wrote that slavery in its most radical form triumphed in the golden age of liberalism and at the heart of the liberal world. How is this possible now when you look at some of the values that liberals associate with themselves, that it was really associated historically, particularly through the uh, 17th and 18th century with the rise of slavery, the expansion of slavery, really. Um, let's, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, Evan Jones, the uh, Australian political economist says, democracy is intrinsically universalist. However, in contrast, liberalism is in essence selective in its attended be beneficiaries. Liberalism in practice is class specific. So let's look at liberalism as a historical project and not simply as a set of ideals. Liberalism in the late tw 20th century, I've mentioned already, was this selective use or revival of economic liberal ideas in the interests of corporate monopolies. And so that was pressing for less state regulation of corporations, privatization or later called public-private partnerships, reduction in state ownership and, and social spending. Um, David Harvey, who's one of the important writers in this area, area in, in current decades, uh, has said that global capitalism was going through a, a enduring problem of overaccumulation since the 1970s, some call it under consumption, some call it overaccumulation, and that the US sought to preserve its hegemonic position, its dominant position, um, in attempts to accumulate by dispossession, which he calls the hallmark of the new imperialism. What he means there is that there has been effectively a theft of resources rather than production, uh, which produces a surplus in the conventional um, sense of the, of the term of productivity. But accumulate by dispossession is really about this voracious project, which is either dispossessing those within a particular state, or, or let's say internal privatization, the, um, the privatization of social assets created by, by social labor power and social um, broader social possessions in the past, or going into other countries, so-called emerging markets and gobbling up those sorts of resources. So this concept of accumulation by possession is something that's been said to be a, a characteristic or a hallmark of the new neoliberalism or the new imperialism. Here's a schema of the Anglo-American liberal project by which I try to contrast liberal idealism on the one side and the Anglo-American liberal project on the other side. So we can see that there is this parallel process where very high minded ideals have been set out. But when we see the actual historical outcomes or the historical projects and their out desired outcomes, we see quite a big difference, quite a big gap. For example, John Locke in the late 
17th century wrote that all men by nature are equal uh, during the English Revolution or, or looking back at the English Re Revolution, yet the outcome in the so-called English Revolution was certainly to reduce the monarch's monopoly on power and property. So property classes consolidated their power to some extent at the expense of the old aristocracy. But at the same time, English private slave trading increased massively in that time. I'll come to that in a moment. Similarly, the American Revolution of the late 18th century, Thomas Jefferson often quoted phrases drawn from previous writings and certainly from the French Revolution, all men are created equal. Yet we know that Jefferson and Washington, uh, many of the leaders of the American Revolution were themselves slave owners, large scale slave owners until the day they died. And that all men are created equal did not, uh, did not mean um, slaves. It didn't mean women either. It didn't mean all uh, European origin men either. It meant people with property. Property owners, it was proper, led by property owners, a bourgeoisie of North America that claimed self-government from Britain. So yes, it was an anti-colonial movement, but the outcomes were deeply problematic. Uh, the Europeans even at the time were questioning, how can you have a revolution which maintains slavery? All of the revolutions in South America and the, the, the initial decades of the French Revolution uh, abolished slavery. The North American Revolution did not do that. Another factor was um, the ethnic cleansing of what the Declaration of Independence called the merciless Indian savages. This was a complaint that the, uh, the revolutionaries made against the British government that they had put some limits on the ethnic cleansing of the North American continent. Well, that process extended across the continent in throughout the, uh, the 19th century as embodied in Western cowboys and Indian uh, movies through Hollywood, for example, and mass slavery was embedded in the New Republic for many, many decades. So another contrast between the idealism and the actual historical project. Uh, similarly, we can say David Ricardo's ideas of free trade and comparative advantage in the early 19th century in England, this was a lot to do with the competition between the new factory owners, the capitalist class, and the landed aristocracy and the tariffs or the import taxes on grain called corn laws, but they were to do with wheat as well. Um, those corn laws were really something which um, held up the, uh, protected the uh, production of the landed aristocracy producing grain, for example, but it also held up the wages for factory workers because wages were linked to the price of uh, bread and bread was linked to the price of wheat. So Ricardo was at this time pressing a very uh, special interest uh, agenda at that time. It wasn't simply an idealism about um, win-win situations and all benefit from trade. Um, the result was that England could import cheap, gra cheap grain, lowering the price of grain, bread and wages. Um, but of course, we know there was no free trade in the British colonies at that time. So this process of a contrast between liberal idealism and the Anglo-American liberal project, the actual historical project, we can trace through a number of phases and I've taken it all the way up to the, the World Trade Organization um, in, the, in the mid nineties. Here's some data on free trade and the rise of slavery after the English Revolution um, and parallel to the late 19th century racializing of American slavery, which didn't begin as heavily racialized as it became um, in subsequent decades. In Britain, the drive for free trade drove an expansion of slavery uh, and the UK Bill of Rights helped free trade and enhanced that slavery. If you look at the, the Royal African Company, which was the state monopoly on, had the state monopoly on slavery in the late 17th century, and they were trading or capturing, kidnapping, um, around 5,000 African slaves per year and sending them across the Atlantic into the colonies. Um, that was a large number of people, but the, the free trade ports of London, Liverpool and Bristol in the, the, well, particularly into the 18th century were doing a lot more. Out of Bristol, there were 18,000 slaves per year in the late 17th century and the British Company of Merchants, London, Liverpool, Bristol by 1771, were transporting 47,000 slaves per year. So you can see that the private participation in slavery, which was a legal process under English law at that time, expanded massively once the private sector got into that uh, 
uh, ugly industry, which had been a state monopoly. Now, I mentioned here the Zong massacre, which was one of the, the test cases of the late 18th century, which helped bring an end to the slave trade, at least as far as Britain was concerned, was uh, this case where the captain of the ship threw about 132 slaves overboard and the subsequent court case and the state lawyers, all sides here, only argued about the lost chattels of goods, not about the, uh, the murder or the slaughter of, of human beings, nothing of the sort. That led to the abolition of slavery in Britain. But with the abolition of slavery in Britain, slavery was not abolished in the Caribbean. It took some decades more for the state to compensate those former property owners, slaveholders, including churches, that uh, bishops that held slave uh, ownership in Jamaica, for example, a couple of decades more that was taken. Here's some of the data on David Ricardo. David Ricardo was talking about comparative advantage and free trade. That's what he's remembered for. But less well, uh, less widely mentioned is the fact that he was really driving an agenda for the new industrial class to try and lower wages, uh, which were being held up artificially, as they put it, by protection of British landowners and the production of grain here. One interesting um, feature here that I want to draw people's attention to is if we look, though, at the two centuries since Ricardo's comparative advantage ideas in terms of the hectares uh, of wheat grown in, in Britain or the tons of wheat produced, we will see that in recent times, Britain is actually self-sufficient in wheat. So what might have seemed a logical uh, argument that um, Britain's entry into free trade supposedly in the early 19th century would lead to greater international specialization as suggested by comparative advantage ideas um, actually didn't happen quite that way that is to say the britain if it ever gained some dependence on imported grain it didn't want to keep up that dependence and eventually under common agricultural policy of the european union britain became quite self-sufficient in wheat by the beginning of the 21st century, for example, just to say how serious really were those claims about uh, international trade benefiting everyone. There was something of strategic importance to the British in terms of growing their own wheat and they didn't really uh, ever give up that idea. John Stuart Mill, similarly, who's remembered for his ideas on individual liberty and the idea of a state not intervening in, in individuals' lives, except where it involved the, uh, the compromise of the liberties of others, nevertheless was very thoroughly embedded in the British colonial process. And so he didn't believe, just as Jefferson didn't believe in equality for slaves, John Stuart Mill didn't believe in equality for the colonies. He used language similar to the French Declaration on the Rights of Man and the Citizen, but he also said that colonization was the best affair of business in which the capital of an old and wealthy country can engage. The same rules of international morality do not apply between civilized nations and barbarians. Any separation from our colonies would greatly diminish the prestige of England, which is a great advantage to mankind. So he was really a creature of empire and his limited views of liberty were for an elite and certainly not for the colonies. Now, a sub-branch of liberalism uh, that was created in the late 19th century, um, which is today called economics, or was uh, dubbed as pure economics in the 1870s by a number of European thinkers, uh, was a very important uh, addition to the historical Anglo-American liberal project, basically. It came about in these circumstances that they, there were dangerous ideas put out by Dave, not just Karl Marx, the radical, but David Ricardo, who was a capitalist, because um, even Adam Smith, who is often cited by uh, conservative liberals these days, Smith, Marx and Ricardo are regarded as classicals in that they shared some areas of concern. They were speaking about uh, labor theories of value. Where did value come from in the productive process? Uh, the division of class and how uh, the, the fruits of that production were distributed amongst classes. So value, class and distribution were the themes of the classical thinkers, Adam Smith, Karl Marx and David Ricardo, political economists. The marginalist school or the neoclassical school with Jevons, Menjo, Walras, 
in the 1870s, later Alfred Marshall, replaced those ideas with very safe mathematical notions of pure economics, utility markets and consumer sovereignty. So those mathematical uh, supply and demand graphs were set up at the very time when the joint stock company was rising and the monopoly power of what were called in other circles the robber barons, that is to say, personalised super rich people that were controlling large industries like oil and railroads and so on, that the, the mathematised view of pure economics was a very effective deflection from a focus on those robber barons and their influence on society. So if you had a whole lot of atomized producers and consumers, there was no real social process to focus on or, or to be resentful of. So these neoclass neoclassical economists of the 1870s were, were very important in uh, building this idea of liberalism as a depoliticized um, process, which could be understood in as a very technical thing and not really a political social process. So if we look at the types of graphs today about so-called so equilibrium prices and markets clearing and so on, things that are very useful in short-term uh, uh, markets, for example, in financial markets and share markets, this is precisely where people make money, uh, the, the financial markets, the stock market, the short-term trading is where money is made. They say very little because they are exercises in, in static or snapshots, if you like, of um, trading processes. They say very little about long-term processes of development and, and so on. Of course, they don't talk about the social relations of production there. So these neoclassical economic liberal ideas still form the basis of mathematized economics today. Uh, so there's no place anymore for value distribution or class interest because distribution is something that is handled by a market when the constraints on markets are removed. If there is no intervention or artificial prices in particular, manipulation of prices or state intervention, then markets will clear at a price which suits both the sellers and the buyers basically. So that's, you get rid of distribution there because distribution is something that a market does in those sorts of ideal circumstances. You get rid of value because there's no such thing as under or over valuation if the markets are working as they're supposed to because price equals value. So the idea of things being overpriced or undervalued doesn't exist. And you get rid of class interest because there is just individuals working here. You don't have to think about monopolies, either, even though monopolies obviously dominate very large sections of contemporary economies but still there is this artificial idea that somehow or other there is this um, atomized uh, world of producers and consumers and monopoly companies and monopoly power don't exist. Of course, it's a dirty truth. It's a dirty reality that's dealt with from time to time, but still the core of contemporary economics ignores this, if not denying it. So those sort of ideas helped underlie the, the new order the new world order after the the at the end of the second world war when the breton at the breton woods conference there was really a competition between the old uh big economic power the financial power britain and the new emerging power the us and the us of course had a much stronger hand by that time when the breton woods conference was created in july uh, was held in july 1944 and the new institutions of the world bank and the imf were created. This is just before, by the way, the United Nations was created and, and certainly before the United Nations had notions of human rights and the Human Rights Commission, for example. So in the mid 20th century, those liberal ideas um, transmitted effectively from a British elite to a US elite helped install a US centered global economy with using the World Bank and the IMF, using the US dollar as a de facto world currency and having for a period of time, at least from 1944 to 1971, fixed exchange rates against the US dollar. Uh, in 1971, those values were floated. And then, as I mentioned before, there was this deregulation of banking, that is to say, removal of social controls where uh, in, in some Western countries, for example, interest rates for home loans or small businesses were fixed and there were social objectives in terms of banking those social objectives in banking were removed and that led to a, an increased power of the private banking sector and, and one effect of which was the 
the debt crisis of 1981. So the US was a beneficiary uh, in many respects of this new order because its currency was held up by everyone else. Everyone else uh, to this day, although it's to a lesser extent uh, these days, but uh, everyone else wanted the US dollar and that held up the value of the US dollar. And that meant that the US could invest in other countries and buy assets in other countries and so on and build up a tremendous stock of assets of foreign investment and get income and income stream from that sort of investment. So uh, using those economic liberal ideas, so they were very important to the current uh, economic order we have today. Now uh, we, we're coming back full circle in a way to neoliberalism, which is dominated by the North Americans in the late 20th century. And I mentioned the period of neo-Keynesian economics where there was greater state role in fiscal management and managing so-called effective demand. Um, sometimes other areas like investment policy, but nevertheless, ne this neoliberalism is commonly thought to have begun in the 1970s when economic crisis um, led to criticism of state ec uh, economic intervention and uh, other ideas such as monetarism and a more limited role of the state in economic management emerged. Now, the external factor is also important for the former colonies that most of the world really, the, the so-called third world or the developing world, the deregulation of banking led to these debt crises in beginning in 1981, the formulation of these structural adjustment policies, and also a much more systematic engagement uh, at the level of multinational corporations and the Western states at trying to determine policy through economic means, through economic uh, monopolies effectively in the developing countries. I mentioned that in 1999, in, in September 1999, at an IMF conference, because of the strong reaction to structural adjustment programs, there were name changes to poverty reduction strategies, good governance programs, and other sorts of financial control regimes. Even debt, pro debt relief programs were linked to these good governance or um, policies that were really part of the Washington consensus. Liberalism historically had lacked historical theory and international theory, whereas there were critiques from the neo-Marxists about economic imperialism, for example, which we'll come to a bit later on. But some new theories, all of them North American, were added later on. So, for example, a developmental theory uh, by Walt Rostow, the, one of uh, a senior US official in the early 60s, spoke of a sort of a, a new mythology of how Britain was supposed to have developed from a traditional agrarian society and took off into uh, industrial growth by harvesting a surplus from that agrarian society by the enclosure of lands and the creation of large scale farming and so on, ignoring entirely feudalism and colonialism, that is to say the actual history of Britain and Britain's development, ignoring the role, not least of India as a massive colony which had provided a huge um, stock of resources and uh, the sugar industry run by slaves in the uh, the Caribbean, for example. Another theory, uh, totally North American theory, hegemonic stability theory was developed in the 1970s and 80s as a counter to neo-Marxist theories of imperialism, um, ignoring the, the European approach that the Europeans all had, uh, the European powers, not all the Europeans, but all the European powers had their own empires and they were called empires and they historically uh, they are still justified. You know, the British say we had a good empire and the Spanish one was, a, was an evil and cruel one and so on. And there's competition between the Europeans in that sort of way. But the US history was that they had never been a colonial power. They'd never been an imperial power. And they were, a, a, you know, a, a state that supported liberty and freedom everywhere, even though they'd conquered territories and bought territories and taken over um, uh, many nations that really still don't have a vote within the US system, you know, Puerto Rico and some of the island dependencies and so on. So this hegemonic stability theory was developed by a man called Charles Kindleberger, who had written about the, the, the mismanagement, if you like, in, during the 1930s depression. And his, his story was, his uh, narrative is that this was because there wasn't a dominant power that was able to manage the global economy at that time. And so his uh, idea was that there was some greater good in having a what he called a benevolent hegemon, uh, 
a, a parallel idea to an imperial power to secure the global environment for liberal free trade. So that was quite a, uh, an innovation in a sense, but a reaction to the constant criticisms, particularly from Latin America, that the US itself had become an empire way back in the 19th century and had intervened many, many times to try and control independent states in Latin America. Well, hegemonic stability theory was one way of justifying this new order or hegemonic neoliberalism, as I'm calling it, in the late 20th century. Uh, it's another way of talking about the political project which selectively borrows liberal ideals, as had Anglo-American liberalism for several centuries, in the service of imperial plans and embedded corporate monopolies. Liberalism was designed for a nation state. It had certain theories about the role of the state and the individual and property rights and so on, but it had to syncretize those views for example, at the international level with neorealism to have international re relevance. So that's why hegemonic stability theory is somewhat of a departure from classical liberalism. Because neoliberalism claims concepts such as pluralism, secularism, human rights, it doesn't mean that it owns those ideas, they have our origins. Um, for example, neoliberals make selective use of human rights, for example, for the new doctrine, or not, not even a new doctrine, it was used in the 19th century too, the doctrine of humanitarian intervention. Typically, they ignore the first article of the International Bill of Rights, the right of the people to self-determination, which is one of the foundations of this course. So let's have a little closer look at hegemonic stability theory. Now, Kindleberger, uh, whose ideas were picked up by some other North Americans, said that the maintenance of free trade required what he called approvingly, a benevolent despot to provide certain institutional and public goods, that is to say, to stabilise the world trading regime, to be a world policeman in some respects, um, to, uh, even though the dominant leader would benefit from that situation, he had acknowledged that, or at least uh, some of those writing in his name acknowledged that, but they claimed that smaller states uh, uh, stood to gain even more in other words, the small states could also participate in this uh, global free trade uh, process and they didn't have to wear the costs of um, policing the international shipping routes and so on, or maintaining international peace and security. You see here a, a role which was really outside any concept of international law because international law uh, created through the UN and through uh, international treaties does not think of a role of an international policeman. It's not, one state has not been given that role, but the, the so-called hegemon or the imperial power in other language, uh, the US in the post-World War II period has arrogated to itself that role of a global policeman and arguing uh, in a utilitarian sort of way that this is necessary and that there are great public good benefits for it for others. Um, and so Snydell, uh, some of the writers following on Kindleberger have said, have acknowledged that, well, there's asymmetry here and how much asymmetry is beneficial to whom under what circumstances. I've given a list of some of the people that have written about this and you'll notice that they are mostly, if not all, North Americans. Here's a sum up of the hegemonic stability ideas. The idea is that there is a process of hegemonic altruism, that is to say the big power, um, they avoid the concept of imperial because imperial to them is a reminder of the type of uh, regime that the American Revolution reacted against in the 18th century, whereas, as I said, in Europe, it has different connotations. Uh, the idea that this big power would stabilize the world order was necessary to stabilize the world order and to create free trade or to guarantee, guarantee the environment in which free trade could be carried out. And also that that uh, hegemon was carrying the military expense for the world. And you can see some echoes of truth in this, in the sense that, well, after the Second World War, when with Germany and Japan effectively disarmed to a certain degree, except to a limited extent, uh, the US was indeed spending more on military uh, spending to secure, for example, NATO or its East Asian alliance, for example. And you could also say that the currencies being linked to the US dollar um, from 1944 to 1971 
stabilized uh, international trade for, for those who engage in international trade, which is largely big companies, uh, because they knew in advance that the value of their trade six months or 12 months down the track would be relatively uh, predictable as compared to the situation in recent decades where we have uh, you know, secondary markets and hedge funds and so on because people take out insurance against changes in, um, changes in the value of currencies, which are unpredictable to a large extent. And that's before we come to speculation on currency markets. Simply insuring against the value of currencies is something that is um, normalized in recent decades. So they're the elements of hegemonic stability theory, which, as I said, is mainly a North American justification for uh, the current situation, even though it was created in the 1970s when you had, to some extent, a bipolar world. You had the Soviet Union and a large socialist bloc associated with it, and the US was not a dominant power at that time. And in recent years, also with the decline of the US economically and the rise of China and uh, uh, some other rival zones, but China in particular, um, the US is not the dominant power in the way that was uh, suggested as beneficial by Kindleberger and the others. It was really a, a, U, a North American apologia for what they wanted to see the US in its extra legal role. As I say, there was no basis, it still is no basis for um, the role in which the US presents itself as a world policeman. In the contemporary hegemonic neoliberal system, I want to point out some other things. First of all, there are sig some significant moral failings of the neoliberal world and of liberalism in general. First of all, it is blind to public-private conflicts of interest. Simply pursuing economic growth through private markets and so on is something that really has eroded substantially the boundaries between public and private. And that's meant that there is this institutionalized or corporate corruption um, that has no real limits like liberal property rights because effectively there are no new regimes of private taxation through monopolies. What do I mean by that is contracts are given out to private companies to run roads, casinos, health services, old people's homes, all sorts of things. And, if, and there are public subsidies given to those uh, private corporations too. It's effectively handing over a license to print money for many of those large private monopolies. And so the the identification of private interest with public services has been so confused now that there is really um, there are very blurred lines in terms of the boundaries between um, public and private uh, interests and so it's very it's very common even in universities for example we now have the corporate university which is has private sponsors which have an enormous amount of influence which is buried and oftentimes uh, with privatized operations of government services or including educational services, it's not possible to get information on those sorts of processes because there is a thing called um, a, a barrier to extracting information that you might get from a government on the, on the basis that it's commercial in confidence information. So there's a much more opaque system as well as these blurred boundaries. Secondly, the neoliberal world and extreme liberalism, let's say, is an assault on the rights of children, which means about half the human race. Why? Because no, children, no child really participates in markets. They are drawn into markets, they are used up by markets in many respects, but the claim, the claim foundation of redistributive justice through markets fails for children. Children, as we know, have to be um, supported at least for 18 years of their life, if not more, and so they don't have a voice in markets and therefore the outcomes of their life, which are often predetermined before they reach the age of 18, are effectively done not by market processes, but or not by a process in which they can meaningfully participate. So liberal uh, focus on markets, particularly the economic liberal focus on markets, doesn't really uh, do anything about the rights of children. Claims to the contrary, because as I said at the beginning, liberalism is this sort of cuckoo uh, syncretic process which adopts values from all over the place to try and make itself look more universal than it is. And thirdly and finally, uh, this neoliberalism or extreme economic liberalism is fundamentally antisocial. Social institutions are constantly eroded, if not destroyed. It's seen as a good thing, a, a question of reform, which only a few decades ago meant to increase participation and benefit large numbers of people. 
reform now means, for example, the uh, involvement of private interests in public health, in public education, um, breaking down other social structures which can be milked for the purposes of private accumulation, because private accumulation is now said to be a social good, um, breaking those public-private boundaries. Eventually, there are reactions, as Karl Polanyi, the um, the great Polish author wrote in the 1940s in his book, The Great Transformation. Society, he says, first of all, society exists, which is an important concept, which is not exactly the same, seen the same way in the Marxist tradition. But Polanyi says, yes, society exists. There are certain functional bonds in society that lead to social reactions to antisocial processes. And society, Polanyi says, will defend itself from this so-called self-regulating market, which is in fact the, the, the process of monopoly corporations which don't have a social conscience, which are bound by their own internal rules to maximize their returns. Like any bank, like most large private corporations, they will keep on going and keep on going until someone tries to stop them. And Polanyi says there is this inbuilt tension then, a double movement in society. Well, the environment I mentioned before is one of US decline, at least since the mid 80s, where the US role as a dominant uh, industrial power and therefore also a trading power has been in decline. The huge US deficits in, on, the, on the current account on, on goods and services since the 80s has led to um, a number of reactions, including the US trying to draw more surplus out of its large stock of foreign investments, trying to more aggressively defend the so-called intellectual property rights, which was set up to protect authors and, uh, and actors and so on, but now they've become the province of corporations. So the US is more aggressively looking at trying to um, uh, defend the, the so-called intellectual property rights of large corporations, whether it's in software or in films or in, in other areas, in pharmaceuticals, for example. So the so-called free trade ideas um, in the World Trade Organization in with the failure of that in the early 21st century in the regional trade agreements are increasingly replaced the concern for trade by unilateral and coercive demands for greater investment privileges, intellectual property rights, rents and technological dominance. And we see that, of course, more most obviously, I suppose, in the in the recent aggressive moves against Chinese tech companies like Huawei, uh, the former President Trump banning Huawei in many respects, um, having one of their officials arrested in Canada for supposedly breaking US unilateral sanctions and so on, really a technological war as well as a um, ideological war going on there. But because the US is on a back foot effectively trying to deal with its decline in terms of its uh, mercantile power and reverting to mercantilism, that is to say, um, greater um, competition rather than cooperation or trade with the rising economic power, particularly in, in China. Now, finally, I want to talk about neo-Marxist theories of imperialism. There are several neo-Marxist theories of imperialism, but they share these elements. And this is to really, I suppose, set up a counter to an alternative interpretation to the world of hege hegemonic neoliberalism uh, from the critical tradition of neo-Marxism, which is largely a 20th century phenomenon. So the main elements of this critique are that 20th century capitalism is dominated by monopoly corporations, large corporations, which corner their markets. They don't really want to engage in competition. That finance capital dominates those large corporations. That is to say, there's a hierarchy of large corporations and finance is at the top of it. And that there is competition between imperial monopolies, which drives colonization, it drives war. And that if you look at the post-colonial period, the colonies were systematically underdeveloped to help build the economies of the colonial powers. Now, one of the ongoing controversies here amongst neo-Marxists is how, are they, how do they interpret the, the rise of powerful states like Russia and China? Does that mean that they, like the former European powers, are now competing imperial powers with the US uh, or are they some sort of countervailing pole going on there? That's an important contradiction I want to come to. Um, going to the history of um, this theory of the 20th century, because it 
imperialism wasn't spoken of by Karl Marx. Karl Marx was a brilliant man talking about the the subtle anatomy of European capitalism in the 19th century up until you know the, the beginning of the second half of the 19th century but his analysis didn't pass into this territory so it was something was created uh, anew and uh, V.I. Lenin the leader of the Russian Revolution was the really the cornerstone of this um, of this new interpretation of imperialism but he drew on some critical liberals, notably John Hobson, who wrote in 1902 a book called Imperialism, where Hobson was saying that imperialism, that is to say the British involvement in its um, colonies, was a counterproductive process which was generating a lot of resentment and was likely to undermine the interests of many of the British investing class, for example, because it favoured certain uh, privileged monopolies, basically, rather than the, the British um, investing classes as a whole. So Hobson said imperialism of the last three decades, he's talking about the late uh, 19th century and in particular the, the so-called uh, struggle for Africa, that is to say the rapid colonization of Africa in the late 19th century by many of the European powers. He condemned it as bad business policy. It's procured a small, bad, unsafe increase of markets and has jeopardized the entire wealth of the nation in rousing the strong resentment of other nations. The business interests of the nation as a whole are subordinated to those of certain sectional interests that usurp control of the national resources. Now, in the process of saying that, he pointed out that there were these powerful um, financial powers, or, or let's say uh, monopolies, who were influencing the state, the British state. And that was an idea that was picked up on by Lenin, who put it into a revised Marxist process. And he suggested uh, really two things, two important ideas. And this was during the First World War. During the First World War, Lenin effectively was, and remember the Russian Revolution occurs during the First World War. It withdraws Russia, the, the Russian Empire from that arena of war and uh, effectively abandons the uh, the ambitions of the Russian Empire there. Um, so Lenin first of all said that it was competition between the British empires that drove war. Well it certainly that drove World War I, that is to say because you had several European empires and the Ottoman Empire for example vying for control for ongoing influence within their uh, existing spheres of influence. And secondly, he, picking up on and using Hobson's idea and also some calculations by a man called Hilfiding, he talks about economic domination through financial monopolies, that there was a new feature here, that, that is to say, uh, the monopolies in finance capitalism and banking had reached a level where they were the most, let's say, pure capitalistic enterprises, which were driving um, behind the power of these European empires, basically. Uh, he famously wrote in his pamphlet in 1916, economically imperialism or the era of finance capitalism is the highest stage in the development of monopoly capitalism, which has grown into a world system of colonial oppression and financial strangulation of the overwhelming majority of the world by a handful of advanced countries. And this booty is shared by two or three world dominating pirates armed to the teeth who embroil the whole world in their war over the division of their booty. So two important ideas that imperial competition between the European empires in particular drove war and that economic domination was occurring more through financial monopolies. Now, of course, imperialism was not a new feature, but it began to be spoke of as a new feature, or as to say, <clears throat> a product of contemporary capitalism with these large finance corporations, which hadn't had the same influence in the past. Now there's a lot written about this, and I'm just going to sum up briefly to give you a flavor of the whole uh, area. But we can say that there's key ideas on in the neo-Marxist tradition on imperialism. First of all, neo-Marxism is different to Marxism in the sense that it's not talking about capitalism as a basically competitive system, as Marx suggested but rather is dominated by monopoly corporations. And there's some important works by Paul Baran, Paul Sweezy about this. That the surplus, which Marx said was extracted by capital from labor, was not just by capital from labor. It was extracted from peripheral economies uh, 
by the core centers of monopoly capital through monopoly power, that is to say, large corporations could extract a surplus from entire economies in the so-called peripheral economies, which means in many respects, the, uh, the former colonies or the existing colonies, um, um, the so-called third world. And there was this unequal trade relationships which allowed monopoly capital in the financial centers like New York and London to uh, extract uh, value from those peripheral economies. The centers of monopoly power accrued then surplus capital, which they were able to export. And in that way, monopoly finance capital drove imperialist ventures. Now, there's a big debate in this territory as to whether you know, the state went into colonies and then the, the finance capital came in later on and took advantage of that colonizing process, or whether the, the finance capital demanded that that colonizing process took place precisely so they could go in and uh, make money out of those new, what is, what is sometimes called these days, emerging markets. So there's a, there's a genuine debate there, which has to do with history and historical evidence. And there are some other neo-Marxist sub-theories, dependency theory, world systems theory, which build on those sorts of ideas. There are post-colonial theorists in the neo-Marxist tradition, for example, in Latin America, in the Caribbean, India, which stress the role of colonial exploitation in development and underdevelopment. That is to say, the, the very industrial development of the European powers was critically dependent on a surplus in the neo-Marxist sense being in the sense of a surplus from the periphery being dr uh, drawn into the center and used to finance uh, industrialization. Just briefly on some other trends in the neo-Marxist tradition there, imperialism in the neo-Marxist sense therefore is more about an economic process. It doesn't necessarily deny the militarized role of of uh, imperialism, of course, particularly in the Latin American experience where there's been many, many invasions, many coups, many interventions um, from the 19th century to the current day there. But nevertheless, the role within the neo Marxist tradition, the role of multinational corporations, monopoly power in a Marxist sense in developing countries is stressed again and again. Uh, there is this notion of the capitalist state too, that is to say that the contemporary state, particularly in the European sense, and most of these theories are, or many of these theories are influenced by European debates. Um, the state is effectively captured by these large corporations, capital, finance capital in particular, and the state only has relative autonomy, it's been said, to do things that go against the interest of those large corporations. It may occasionally, under a lot of pressure, um, introduce some new taxes or some environmental controls, but by and large, the capitalist state is doing the bidding of the dominant fractions of capital within its ambit, let's say. We also have this notion of the Washington Consensus, which I've discussed, the, this package of policies which has been enforced in other countries through economic pressures, uh, including structural adjustment programs, so-called good governance programs, and so on. And we have this um, idea from the dependency school that uh, countries are dominated through monopoly power and can't even develop their own elites, their own industrial uh, processes properly. So they become backwaters, as Andre Gunder Frank wrote of many of the Latin American countries, backwaters which are dependent on exporting commodities and not being, being held back in their industrial development there. Those ideas were challenged to some extent by the rise of the so-called East Asian tigers, industrialization in East Asia in countries like South Korea and Singapore, which managed to break out of that backwater of, um, of dependence. But nevertheless, those dependence ideas still have a lot of influence in, in Latin America, where there's been less of that sort of process. There are some weaknesses in these theories. I suggest that there are a number of ahistorical readings of Lenin's theory, which could lead, for example, to the mistaken collusion, uh, conclusion that China, which is by far the major capital exporter in the world today, even though the U in recent years the US has been blocking its, um, its investment in the US itself, uh, is an imperial rival to the US. Um, I suggest that's not at all a good parallel, um, even though the US, uh, the US, despite its economic decline, 
It maintains 800 foreign military bases around the world, driving dozens of international conflicts. Now, China has a lot of economic power with its capital now. It's investing in many countries, gaining influence in that sort of way. But it's not having the same sort of impact today as the US, US has, even though the US has now become a net capital importer. So the old, more, uh, let's say, economistic view of imperialism as a function of finance capital and the expansion of finance capital doesn't really apply in the same way today. If we look at the realities of the US and China, we have a very different history today to that of 100 years ago. So the conclusion there, I suggest, is be wary of narrow economistic readings of theory. And just to sum up on that, some of the problems of neo-Marxist theories of imperialism, they have appropriately drawn attention to the role of giant corporations and finance capital in arming new projects of domination. That is to say, they draw attention to the power of these uh, banking sectors and large corporations in the expansion, the aggression and the wars, contemporary wars, gaining uh, exclusive access or privileged access to resources of other regions. That is something, something totally traditional, but in the sense of new giant multinational finance uh, corporations, something that's also relatively new. But some of the theorists uh, disregard the lessons of previous imperial ages. So there's a debate, for example, uh, about whether Russia or China are competing empires with the US, which I suggest is a, a very poor parallel. It's not the same as the competition between the British, the French, the German, the Austrian and the Ottoman Russian empires of 100 years ago. Many of the versions of these theories also ignore the imperial resource drain from the colonies and, and People have written about it for many decades now, particularly writers from the Caribbean, from Latin America, from India, for example. But there, there was a huge feature of the development of the European imperial powers that they were extracting resources, um, sometimes simply just gold, bullion and, and uh, other precious metals, but also resources, um, exploiting labor resources and so on for their own development. And that's not really often taken into account by the Eurocentric views. So technocratic and ahistorical views might wrongly see China as the main contemporary empire, or at least the, a competing contemporary empire from its capital exports alone, ignoring the enormous military projection today of the US. So, Summing up on hegemonic neoliberalism, there is a contemporary synthesis really um, in consistent with the history of Anglo-American liberalism where they have incorporated what could be called a new colonialism in that this system requires expansion and domination to reproduce its essential features, especially with its lead hegemon, the US, in decline. This new colonialism can be seen in attempts to legitimize imperial double standards through globalist integration, hegemonic stability ideas, which are inconsistent with contemporary international law uh, since the 1960s, but assisted by their new doctrines of humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to protect, which are uh, aggressively promoted these days. So this, in a sense, represents continuity of Anglo-American liberalism. It was a historical imperial or hegemonic project, not simply a tradition of liberal idealism. It was something that had always had a very strong class basis at home and an imperial element uh, externally. And that expansion was essential for the project. So to sum up overall, Anglo-American liberalism was and remains a historical class and imperial project, which draws only selectively on syncretic liberal idealism for its legitimacy. It's very popular, a liberal idealism, but it masks the key priorities of the historical project. For over three centuries, Anglo-American liberalism has extended elite privileges at home and abroad using these deceptive universal rationales. But universalism has never been the strong point of Anglo-American liberalism. Economic liberalism was a very important subset of this historical project created in the latter part of the 19th century, which served to hide the corporate face of economic domination behind mathematical modeling. Hegemonic neoliberalism in the late 20th century um, revised itself again, synthesizing this selective liberal ideology with the new post-colonial doctrines of domination. That is to say, the, the, the US role in hiding uh, colonial ambitions, 
necessitated a new language. The post-colonial era also required it because colonialism was no longer acceptable. Um, so new ideas had to be developed to justify the new regimes. And economic theories of imperialism um, from the Marxist tradition drew attention to this new synthesis, but often created too narrow a basis for understanding highly adaptive post-colonial imperialism uh, or hegemonic neoliberalism. Finally, there are some important books which you might like to look up from Lacerdo, from David Harvey, from Radhika Desai, from Karl Polanyi, important readings to study more on liberalism and neoliberalism. See you next time.